Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Barry Norman from Expert Admissions, and we have another exciting panel this evening. We're talking about college essays and the application process, and we're going to take a little bit of a tour through New England um, with representatives from Tufts and Yale, and we're so happy that you joined us. I'm going to um, allow our guests to introduce themselves in a moment while people are queuing into the room. Um, just a reminder, we're happy to have you ask questions. If you can do it in the Q&A box, um, that would be great. You can also do it in the chat, but it just might be harder for us to see. So if you can do it in the Q&A, we have questions, of course, prepared from ones that you've asked in advance as well. And um, without further ado, I'll let our guests give quick introductions. And if we could start with um, JT and then uh, pass it on to Corinne. Hi, everyone. My name is JT Duck. I use he series pronouns, and I am the Dean of Admissions and Enrollment Management at Tufts University, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. My name is Corinne, uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a Senior Assistant Director of Admissions at Yale, and I am really excited to be here with you all. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. So we have a bunch of questions. We're going to get right to it. Um, and first, I want to start with the application process, as we often do. Um, this is a part that a lot of people are really curious about. It's a black box for a lot of people on the other side, and so it's helpful to know what actually happens to an application once students hit submit. So if each of you could um, speak about just like how many reads each application gets and how it's decided who reads applications in some, some offices, it's geography, maybe it's alphabetical. So if you could just take us through that part of your process, that would be great. And Corinne, we can start with you. Sure, can you hear me? I think that there's an audio issue, it seems like. Oh, hold on one second. I see there is something I, I hear just fine. Um, let's see, are we, let's see one second. Very dim audio. So it it's seems like closer. it's next. Okay, it's I'm just gonna go minute. for it. Uh, I can hear you also as long as you can hear me. Um, I, sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm a little repeat. overwhelmed by all the audio things. Okay, they're saying it's better, so I think- Perfect, okay, let's, let's go from there. <laughs> All right, restart. So um, for application reading, how, how is it decided um, who reads what, like based on, on geography, on alphabetical, and um, if you could take us through that process of what it looks like on, um, on, the, on that side. Absolutely, some of my favorite things to cover. So at Yale, we are um, divided up regionally, basically, and it's division based on application numbers, um, and some of them make no sense at all. So I cover uh, nine different states across the United States, for example. Um, I read Michigan, Kentucky, Tennessee, South Carolina, Nevada, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. I think I got them all colleague who reads just Florida um, because it's the same amount of applications, right? And so we divide up around the country. We have 26 admissions officers in our office um, and also internationally. Um, and again, it's just based on application numbers. Uh, I will read all of the applications that come from those states. Many of them will get a second person reading them. And then all of our applications are seen by an admissions committee who will decide uh, whether a student is a good fit for Yale. Thank you. And JT, what about you guys over at Tufts? Yeah, so our, our, some similarities and some differences. So our uh, each of our applicants are part of a geographic territory and, uh, and assigned to an admissions officer based on their territory. Um, every single application is reviewed in a committee at every point in our process. Uh, so, so we have sort of mini committees uh, that involve the territory manager and one or two additional staff members uh, that are uh, reviewing the application and determining where it goes next in our in our very iterative process. Um, the territory manager often knows the schools a little bit better and is focused more on understanding the students' academic performance in context. Um, and the other readers are, are focused a bit more on essay review and other parts of the application. And every application is discussed by multiple members of our committee. Terrific. Yeah, and there are that I think it's important and, and to for people to hear that 
there are, like you said, JT, similarities and differences. Um, and it really, it really depends on what school you're applying to. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the distinguishing features in each of your offices. Um, can you each walk us through what it looks like on your end, how you see an application. Uh, people are particularly interested in how you see scores. Students obviously are asked to input highest scores only, but you may be receiving uh, official score reports. So if you could let us know what it looks like on your end and particularly with regard to the scores. And um, JT, if you could start, that would be great. Sure. So when I started reading applications 20 plus years ago, these were like paper files that we would lug, like lug home and sit in the office and read and, and look at every single piece of paper front and back and color code and all of that. What we see now are just digital PDFs in our electronic reader system. <laughs> so we're just sort of flipping through pages of a PDF. Uh, when it comes to scores, uh, the way that we have that system set up is that only the student's highest uh, uh, evidence-based reading and writing score or their highest SAT math score or their highest ACT composite score or subscores, only those highest scores are showing up on the front page of their application as one of many, many, many data points that we see on our journey into the application. Um, and we only see those scores if students have indicated that they want us to see scores as part of their application review. Um, we actually don't show our readers the score page from any of the applications. And so we don't see the common app score page that they fill out. We don't even, that's, that, that page is suppressed from our reading system. We just see the data points that show up as the highest points on the front page of our reader screen. Um, and we will see every recommendation that they send in. We'll see all their supplemental materials. All of those things show up in our, in our electronic reader system. All right, I busted out the better, hopefully. Is this better? All right. So we'll go from here. Uh, a lot of similarities to what JT just said, a couple of differences. Uh, we don't see anything about scores on the first page. Like when we first open an application, we're seeing like name information and school and all of that type of stuff. Um, we have to kind of scroll a bit to get to scores. And even before we were test optional, uh, we definitely only spent like a two second glance on scores. These are not entrance exams. A good score is not going to be the thing that gets a student into our institutions. Um, it's just a part of the larger evaluation. Uh, now, when we continue on, if we actually ask all of our students right now, because we are currently test optional, do you want your testing reviewed? Yes or no. Um, that's actually a supplement that students will answer once they submit our application, or it might be on the supplemental part. I'm not sure how they're doing it this year. Um, if they say yes, then there's a couple of places, including that Common App, if they're using the Common App score sheet where we'll see it. If they say no, it suppresses it and we don't say and see anything. For us, if a student selects no, they can always submit scores later. If they select yes, they do want their scores reviewed, they can't walk back on that. Um, we can't guarantee that we haven't already reviewed the application with them. Um, so that's sort of something to know about our application process this year. Uh, but overall, that's kind of how we walk through. I would say everything else is very similar to what JT just said. Great, thank you. And thank you for thinking to do that uh, thing because the feedback now is that they can hear you for those who weren't able to before. Um, and what about committee? So um, even this is different from school to school. Some places have committees, some don't. Some have all applications go through committee, some only have some. Um, can you tell us what committee looks like for you um, and just sort of the final decision-making process, uh, you know, just more generally? Corinne, we can start with you. Yeah, um, I've actually worked at two institutions that are very different. One had no committee at all. It was just two readers. And if they were stuck, it was maybe a third reader. Um, Yale has a really, really extensive committee process. Um, in the fall, we're in committee for 
probably three weeks on those early action decisions. And then in the spring, it could be six weeks. Um, every application passes through committee. A uh, committee is made up of five people who all get a vote on whether a student is a good fit for Yale. One of those people is always the regional admissions officer because they know the student, the school, the state, the country better than anyone else. Uh, they can answer questions about it. Um, and then the others will be two admissions officers and generally a faculty and a staff member. Uh, we're one of the only schools that use faculty and staff. We do that because faculty, first and foremost, we are an academic institution and want to make sure that students can do the work. Uh, staff, because we are very heavy on our residential college system. If you're not familiar with Yale or what that means, I recommend going to one of our uh, information sessions that we offer throughout the week. Uh, but the staff members are usually the deans or the heads of the residential colleges that can talk about whether a student is a good roommate, classmate, suite mate, residential college member. Honestly, uh, it's the rare exception that a committee discussion talks about a student's academics, transcript, or extracurriculars. About 80% of our academics are academically qualified and have done activities that we would expect to see. So really, those committee discussions are centered around kind of that idea of are they going to be a good community member. Thank you. Okay. And then... Um, I don't know if this is a fair question to ask JT, but I'm gonna ask it for of both of you. Um, have you ever wanted to admit a student and you couldn't get them through? And for those of you who don't know, um, JT is the Dean in his office. So I'm very curious about his response to this question. So maybe let's start with you, JT. Don't, no need to put you on the spot, of course. Sure. But... <laughs> so, so I'm happy to talk about that. So, so uh, like Corinne, I, I've worked at a, a few different places. I've, this is actually the fifth university that I've worked at. So I've seen this process done differently. And every institution has a process that works for them for how they review applications, different variations of committee at, at Tufts. Um, we practice something called committee-based evaluation, um, where again, every application is read in, in small committees and the committees grow in size the further along an application gets in our process. It is very iterative and it is, it is thorough. Um, uh, uh, the pointed question about whether a student that I want to see admitted does not get in, yeah, that happens a bit. Uh, I, I am one person and, and just a member of a committee um, and always have been at the places that I've worked. Um, there are students that I believe uh, very strongly in um, and the rest of the committee just isn't seeing it or there are other great students that they believe more strongly in. And so we have those conversations. Um, so I, it, so it, is, it is this very human, very iterative and very committee driven process as we work towards building a class um, that we're really excited about every year. Um, I know it's, it seems um, that um, when, you, when you haven't been part of a committee process, you know, when I was in admissions, it was, I mean, it was, it was tough on certain days and it was really emotional and, you know, there wasn't, it wasn't just a very easy sort of like vote and most people saw the same thing and it was, it was hard and I think also there are a lot of students who feel that you know that the person reading or the person res primarily responsible for the application can kind of get them in, or just if they like them, it's good enough. But it's it's so much more. And for both of you, you receive so many more applications um, from students than you can admit, and most of them are great. I know that, and so it's um, it's it's encouraging, um, although I know difficult to hear that it really is a process, and it can feel very random on the other side. So it's helpful for you to let us in a little bit. Corinne, I think I know the answer for you, but um, have you been able to, have you also had this situation where you want to bring someone through and it just can't happen? Every hour of every day in committee, I would say. Um, my vote is equal to the other four committee members um, for good or bad, right? I vote in other committees as well that aren't my territory that I'm not as emotionally connected to and attached to. Um, and I have to, as just a voting member of the sort of think about the larger process and if that student is the right fit. One of my colleagues uses this really mosaic uh, where you're only using 2000 pieces right 
you can take 2000 and put it together and it's going to be beautiful. And then you can set those aside and take another 2000 and put it together and it's going to be equally beautiful. Um, so there's so many more students that could be a fit for our institutions and could thrive there than who we're able to take. And so we just have to, as JT said, just try and trust our committee members in the process. Um, I've never left committee crying. Um, I've definitely been in committee where I was not happy and just kind of got really quiet for a little bit. And Barry's known me for years, so if I'm quiet, I'm not happy. Um, but I mean, weeks later, you just have to kind of trust that you're bringing in the best class that you can. I was never moved to tears, but I was angry. <laughs> Um, and then what about um, how many applications do you estimate that you read in a day during like kind of typical day reading season and about how much time realistically do you get to spend on each one? Um, JT, if we could start with you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'll be honest, I have a lot of trouble like quantifying this um, because it changes uh, depending on who you're reading and, 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 and how early you are in the reading season. We start off a bit slower um, and sort of ramp up our pace a little bit as we go. Um, I would say we try to read a couple dozen uh, a day when we're in our groove. Um, and because we're, we're talking about them as part of committee-based evaluation, we're actually not taking any notes or very not very many notes at all. And I found before we moved to this model of reading, we would spend 15, 20, 25 minutes on a file, half of which was spent summarizing our notes and sort of writing down these very copious notes. Removing the note taking piece and instead having a dialogue with your committee partner has made that process work a bit better, I think. I think it's I think it's actually a better process. Um, but it also takes a little bit less time. So it's a few dozen files during the during the dur a day during the reading season. When we pivot to our final larger committees, some of those files are very quick. Um, no one gets in unless they go through one of those final committees. Some of those conversations are quick because the student is outstanding. And this is like, we feel really, really good about the student. And we might sail through that application in just a couple of minutes. And other applications might take 15 or 20 minutes. And we need to take a break and hit pause and come back and refresh our minds and all of that because they're just really weighty and heavy files. And so it, it does vary depending on the candidate. What about you, Corinne? Yeah, so it's going to differ, as JT said, from time of year. Um, in early action, we read fewer applications, but they tend to take us longer. We're sort of, um, we've just spent eight or nine months away from the process. We have to get ourselves back into the swing of things. And some of those files can be very dense uh, because the students really self-select themselves as good fits for our institution. Um, by regular decision, my goal every day, uh, Monday through Friday, is generally to read 25 to 30 files. Um, and then on the weekends, I try to read 25 to 30 across both days to just give myself a little bit of buffer. I always get sick. Um, I am always trying to give myself a few days head start there. Um, I'll actually kind of be more specific. Last year, I read about 2,200 applications before committee. Um, and then in committee, again, I sit there and vote in other committees. So I probably saw like thousands more essays and applications in a given year. Um, so that's that's kind of how we do it. Um, again, I've worked at other institutions. I know people at many other institutions. Um, it's not uncommon for people to read 50 or 60 files in a day by themselves. Um, and at Yale, I really, really like that I one time had like a streak, a hot streak. I was reading like 35 a day and my boss actually reached out and said, are you reading too quickly? Um, because they want to make sure that we're giving everyone enough time. Um, and I was like, yep, I don't know what's happening. I guess I just drank a lot of coffee. Uh, but we generally spend, I would say, eight to 15 minutes per file is a good estimate. Um, some of the longer ones are our QuestBridge applications or ones with really extensive um, STEM research. I am terrible at math and not a scientist, so those do take me a little bit longer to figure out what's going on. Um, and I'm not saying they're longer in a good or bad way, um, but most will take eight to 15 minutes. And Corinne, can I ask you a follow-up question to that? Sure. Um, when you have somebody who's giving you really specific, like higher level information than you could realistically um, assess, 
Um, is that still kind of you have to kind of work through it or is there ever, um, you know, whether it's faculty or something like that where things might get bumped to to give some sort of translation for lack of a better way of putting it? Sure, I think that's a really good question. So if the if I love a student and the case does not rest in the flute performance or the research that they sent, then I can make those decisions and try and suss it out. Um, but if kind of they're coming at us as like what I'm adding to the Yale community is my talent in dance or is kind of my background in STEM and research, then we have faculty that will evaluate kind of those art supplements. We have a STEM team that will know what's going on in astrophysics that I don't. Um, but I always caution students, we have a really good website that talks about what we do and don't want in terms of supplements um, because they're not evaluated by me. I can barely play the radio. So I am not evaluating piano performance or musical singing ability that's going to faculty in those departments. So if you're not actually pretty high level, that might not be something that you want us to get an evaluation on. Thank you. That's super helpful. And I love your website, the page about supplemental materials. If you haven't been to it, um, for those listening, go. It's very honest and it's super helpful and it will answer your question of whether or not to send it. Um, JT, at Tufts, it's a little bit different than at Yale in that you can apply to arts and sciences, engineering, SMFA. Um, how is reading assigned or is it assigned differently depending which program or school you're applying to or does everybody read for all the different schools? Uh, that is a great question. So yeah, so Tufts has three different undergraduate schools. And when students apply to Tufts, they choose which of the schools they're applying to, which one they want to be considered for, and that's the school that they start out in. And just to complicate it more, there's two different SMFA programs that you can apply to, which is our, which is our School of Fine Arts. Uh, so we ask students to identify where they want to start, um, and we do take that into consideration in the review process at every stage of review and, and committee. Um, that said, it is the same group of readers um, that are doing that first initial committee um, on every single application, and so students are read by their territories um, in their first round. When they go to that final committee that's a larger group, if they have applied to one of the art programs, um, then we have done a, a review of their art portfolio that is done by experts um, that can that truly understand their art. To Corinne's point, I am not an artist. Uh, so we have folks that understand the art and the talent there and the voice that students are conveying. And, and that assessment is brought into the conversation. Um, and there is a team of folks in our, our SMFA admissions office that are present for all of those final committee conversations on our art school applicants. Um, for arts and sciences and engineering, everyone in the entire staff could be involved in those conversations. We don't have separate committees for engineering versus arts and sciences. Um, and uh, we're looking for a lot of similar tough C qualities in all of the students that we are admitting. Thank you, that's super helpful. Um, Corinne, there's a big sense um, that now I'm getting to kind of major different from program or school. There's a big sense that what major you specify on your application has a really significant impact on one's ability to get in. And could you speak to the extent to that is true or not and um, give any advice for people who are having some second thoughts or trying to figure out, you know, should I put a major down or not? This is a great question, and I think that it's going to differ from school to school, as a lot of these do. Um, for Yale, we're actually admitting every student to Yale College, um, which houses our 80 majors. We're not admitting to a separate school of engineering or a separate program in music or theater or anything like that. And we're not looking for students to come in as those majors. We ask for three areas of academic interest. Uh, it's not a declaration of major. We're not holding students to anything. It's just giving us a sense of what that student might want. So some students will put uh, biology, biomedical engineering, and neuroscience. And some students are going to put art history, uh, environmental engineering, and dance, right? And neither of those is better or worse. Neither of those has a better or worse shot of getting into Yale. Um, sometimes this, if a student has a very narrow interest, that can help inform some of maybe their extracurricular choices or things like that, but it's not an advantage. Um, 
ultimately the students that come to Yale, uh, we were actually just talking about this before the call, uh, about 30% of them come in completely undecided, about 50% will change their mind and change their major at least once. And we know nationally that number is as high as 80%. So it's not gonna have any weight or bearing on whether a student gets into Yale. You should put what you are interested in because sometimes when people try to fake it, we can actually tell like three pages into the application that, oh, you put classics, but you've never taken like a Latin or a Greek class, and you've never even like taken a high level English class. I don't think that that's actually the case. And that can be a little bit of a flag for us, honestly. Thank you. And JT, I assume since we talked about schools and programs that you're not in, in, uh, admitting by major within the schools, right? No, we're, we're not admitting by major. We, we give students, it sounds like similar to Yale, we give students space to list up to three potential majors that they're thinking about um, without holding them to it at all. So really the, really the choice for students is do they want to start out in the School of Engineering or in the School of Arts and Sciences or in the SMFA? That's really the choice that we ask them to make. And some students can switch schools after they enroll. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. Um, but they can worry about picking their major later on. Or if you're like me, you can change it twice. <laughs> um, so um, switching gears a little bit to interviews, um, each of your schools does it a little bit differently. Um, with Yale, since the pandemic, they switched their policy where it's by invitation only and virtual. At Tufts, um, it is uh, evaluative and optional. So can you, um, Corinne, maybe we could start with you this time. Um, can you talk a little bit about Yale's uh, new as of last year policy? I know a lot of people are like, what does it mean if you're invited or not? We wanna hear about that. Um, and just share a little bit about this new, this new approach to interviewing. Yes, so honestly, our communication team has put up some beautiful language online about the interviews that capture exactly what it is, um, but, it's truly where we are inviting students for whom we think an interview will give us a little bit more information that we don't necessarily have or that we think that the admissions committee might need. Um, that does not mean if you're not offered an interview, it doesn't really mean anything because that could mean you're a stellar candidate that we just don't see the need for one or it might be a candidate where even an interview isn't really going to make the jump and push them into the class. Uh, I wouldn't take a guess at either of those because as JT and I already said tonight, we don't even know who's going to get admitted when we go into the admissions committee a lot of the time. Um, so it's really for candidates where we think we might need some more information. Now, interviews, again, as Barry mentioned, they're invitation only. Sort of, I always like to think of it as the only thing in this process that's kind of guaranteed to hurt a student is if they decline that interview, um, because it can be seen as a lack of motivation or interest, um, or especially because we cannot reach everyone, we don't have as, enough alums around the country to do that. It's really kind of taking a slot from someone else who could have used it. Um, so I will always just say, if you reached out for one, one, do it. Don't read too much into it one way or the other, um, but that's kind of how it works. I can put the language uh, on our website in the chat. Thank you. And what about it at Tufts JT? So at Tufts, uh, we allow any applicant to request an interview. Uh, you cannot request the interview until after the application is submitted. So it's in the applicant portal that students do that. Um, and as you might imagine, there's a lot of applicants that apply late December, very early January, and, and it gets very busy with the request at that point. So we actually turn off that functionality in very early January. So soon after students apply, they're encouraged to request an interview if they want one. Uh, we don't guarantee to meet every request, um, just because, uh, to, to Corinne's point, that we don't have enough alums uh, out there that are doing interviews for us to, to meet the, the full demand. So it's optional for students. Um, it is evaluative. Um, it's a conversation with an alum. They're all taking place virtually now, um, and it's 30 to 45 minutes, and the topic is the student, and, and no one is the expert on the student more than the student. Um, so it's not a, it's not a, it's not the, the reason students get in or don't get in. It's a chance for them to learn more about Tufts, and us to learn more about them and a report then gets attached to their application record that's reviewed by our committee, which is just a summary of the conversation. Terrific. Thank you. And thank you for clarifying because that's a part that can be confusing. It also varies quite a bit um, from school to school. 
Um, now I want to switch to essays, uh, which is sort of the, the sort of sub um, topic of, of this discussion. Um, and if we could start out uh, by just asking you about, um, it could be a specific essay or just like just a memorable essay for you, what either generally what would a memorable essay sound like or, or include, um, or if you have one in particular that you'd like to share with us. And um, JT, we'll start with you. Sure. So if, if there's anyone that's watching tonight that has seen me present in recent years, you've heard me talk about this essay. This is an essay that I read a couple of years ago, and it um, uh, it's about video games. Uh, I, I, I am not a gamer. Uh, I have not played video games since the 80s. I grew up in the 80s and played Atari, and like that's my knowledge of video games. Um, but it but it turns out that when you play video games in in this century, uh, you can play these multiplayer online video games where you are in your house on your computer, competing against the, your friends who are in their houses, talking to each other over technology in these multiplayer games. I didn't know that until I read this essay from this kid. Um, so he started out his essay um, by self describing as being a bro. Um, this sort of jockey, goofy, masculine, baseball cap wearing bro. And he would go to school every day and he would bro it out with the other bros at his school. So he and the other like macho guys would like wear their baseball caps and sit in the back of their AP English class and bro it out. They would go to the dining hall or the cafeteria together and like do their thing and just be these like sort of immature guys, right? Um, and they would go home at the end of their days um, and, and go back to their respective houses and log into these multiplayer online video games and start beating each other up playing video games while they're talking to each other. But oftentimes what they would talk about are the things that they thought emasculated them or weakened them in some way. So things like, like one of them talked about how he'd asked a young woman to the homecoming dance and she had turned him down and he was devastated because he thought that they had a thing and she did not think that they had a thing. So he just felt like just totally blindsided by that. Um, and another one's talking about how he told his mom he had studied for the AP chemistry exam but he hadn't. So when he got his score back, it was not very good and he was gonna be grounded. And that was a whole situation. Like he like didn't do what he was supposed to do. So all these things that they weren't, these young men were not ready to talk about face to face because they were putting on airs and bravado and all of that goofy guy stuff. They had found another forum with which to have that conversation. So I read this essay as someone working at a residential liberal arts college. And I was just like, this essay is gold. This is, this is such gold, not because it's the most extraordinary topic in America, not because I learned something new about video games, although that's, that's intellectually interesting. It's because I have a really, really good window into who this young man is. And I know that when he comes to my campus, he's going to show up on day one and he is going to bro it out <laughs> and he's going to be that guy but he's going to be looking for ways to connect with other people at a deeper level. And so from this sort of, sort of uh, non-traditional but benign essay topic, I got a good sense of how he interacts with other people and that there's a level of depth. And then I looked at it next to his recommendation letters and it all synced up. <laughs> it all made like who he described himself as being in the classroom was who his teacher said. And they all talked about this depth in his writing and this depth of thinking that isn't always present in his persona in the classroom. I mean, that's magic when you read that kind of stuff in essays. Perfect. There it is. <laughs> Corinne, what about you? Yeah, definitely. I always have one that immediately comes to mind, and it's from my very first year at Yale. Um, so that's how much it kind of stuck with me. And it stuck with me for two reasons. Um, one, the topic and the way that the student wrote, but the second was also the committee's reaction to the essay. Um, so this was a, a girl in Tennessee that I was reading her application, um, and she wrote how her one of her classes in high school during junior year, they had this assignment where everyone had to go for a day without complaining. And she started out the, the essay explaining that and saying, 
I was like, that's easy. I'm actually going to do this for a week. Um, and that's the went newsflash, not easy. One of the hardest things I've ever done. And went on to explain that she realized how much she and her friends and just the school in general was kind of based on this complaining culture. And from that, she decided with one of her friends, they created uh, a mentorship club that would help with freshman girls who felt like they were being bullied um, and what she wanted to do with that when she came to college and sort of joined the same thing. So in the actual essay, I saw this arc. First of all, I loved that this was not something unique. Anyone at any school around the country or the world could have had this experience, but it really showed me who she was and how she reflected and what kind of student she'd be on our campus. And she took that forward. I always love when an essay kind of ends with like the forward thinking in the personal statement and where the student is going from there. But what I really loved is when the committee read this essay, um, everyone voted to admit her, but the reason why was really interesting. Um, about how this student had written that she and her friend were co-presidents of this club. Um, and they said, how many students in our pool would have just said president? How many students would have inflated that title? How many students would have shared not or like chosen not to share that glory? And we say that all the time. And the reality is on our campus, we're really looking for collaborative students who aren't competing with each other in that way. And that single word was the reason why that student was admitted. I mean, she was amazing in every way, but I know that that's sort of what got the committee on board. Yeah, I think it's so helpful to hear this from both of you because so often people think the essay has to sound smart um, or intellectual or whatever, um, or they'll look at the essay and say, oh, that seems too basic or simple. And it's precisely that, right? That you'll decide whether or not academically someone's where you want them to be from other stuff. It's not gonna be from this essay. And so to hear both of you speak with such honesty is, is super helpful. And I can't tell you how grateful I am. Um, so, and those are awesome essays, I agree. You really feel like you know that person and it compels you to want them to be on your campus. And that's ultimately the, ultimately the goal for sure. Um, for both of you also, I would love to hear, uh, speaking of essays, um, how, do you, how do you determine fit like personal essay, main essay, let's call it versus supplements? Because I'd like to switch to supplements um, for a moment. And um, Corinne, if we could start with you. Yeah, so we tend to think of kind of that personal statement as we know it's, it's a little more polished. It's where the student's spending a lot of their time. But the supplements are really where we're getting to know the student. Um, and I would say that every school that has supplements, they're telling you as much about their institution as they're trying to learn from you. So when we ask on our supplement about um, a community that a student is a part of, that's because our school is very centered around this idea of community, right? When we ask what gets a student intellectually or academically excited, that's because we are really thinking about this intellectual engagement piece on our campus. And so I would encourage you when you're doing these to first think about do I actually like what these questions are asking? I might not like answering them or having to write essays, but is what the school is telling me about them something that I am interested in pursuing? And that's where fit goes both ways. And so I think that when we get into the supplements, that's what our committee really wants to see. That's what myself as an application reader is really thinking about the fit. Because again, by the time we're getting to those essays, most students could fit into the that mosaic and do the work and be great on a highly selective or selective college campus, right? And so, especially with the Y Yale, if we're kind of on the fence about someone, that's where we turn. We look to see, do you actually know what you're getting yourself into here? Um, and are you going to add to our community? But also, what are you going to take away? Are you going to take advantage of our resources and opportunities? Because a lot of students will if you aren't the one that wants to. And JT, what about you? Yeah, a great question. So I will, I, uh, so a few things come to mind. One, when, I, when I'm reading the big essay, the main personal statement, um, there are typically four questions that are going through my mind and, and I'm looking for 
a response to any one of the four questions. I'm, I'm asking myself, what motivates this student? I'm asking myself, um, what does this student think about? I ask myself, how does the student problem solve? And I ask myself, uh, how does the student work with other people? So those are the four questions. What motivates them? What do they think about? How do they problem solve? How do they work with other people? That's sort of like generally like trying to understand like who this young person is whose application I'm reading in this moment. Um, Corinne said it really well. The, the, the main essay tends to be more polished and more attention is paid to that. <laughs> uh, and a lot of students will wait till December, or wait till shortly before the deadline to work on those supplemental essays or they'll be overwhelmed with like the number of them or try to co copy paste and use multiple versions of them and all of that. Um, candidly, uh, a lot of folks in, in the Tufts office, when they open an application to start reading it, they will often turn to those supplemental essays first um, to ground their thinking of who this young person is and how that young person sees their fit with Tufts. Because one of our questions is, why are you applying to Tufts? And that then becomes the, the, the grounding for the rest of the application. So th those, those are really important. I mentioned earlier that we're looking for Tufsy qualities, regardless of school that a student applies to. Um, we, if you go to our, the Tufts admission site, we put those qualities aloud and clear. They're the first words that you encounter on the page. Um, it's things like intellectually playful, uh, kind. Uh, that is a big one at Tufts, kindness. Um, collaborative, uh, globally minded civically engaged. Those are those are tough qualities that we look for. Um, it's hard to be all of those things in spades in every credential in a file, right? Um, but we're, those are generally the types of qualities that we tend to look for across all of our applicants. And the other thing I'll say is that we are we're not looking for a super applicant. Uh, so fit is not one type of person, is not one type of background, is not one type of extracurricular engagement or one type of essay. Um, I like this mosaic idea, I like that a lot, um, that we're really looking for uh, different people who bring different qualities and different strengths. That's, in, that's intentional. We build this really diverse applicant pool, so we have a, a diverse group of students to pull from. Students who may be nothing like each other but they're both so toughs. Um, that's part of the beauty of, of having a really diverse community is that you can be different folks. And so um, when, you, when, when students are thinking about fit, I want them to think about like, what's the culture like on campus? What opportunities are available? What do students talk about? Do I, see, do I have a sense of belonging when I, when I learn about this place? And, 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 and uh, those are the types of things that they're looking for, but different students will have a sense of belonging at different places. Thank you. Um, and speaking of supplemental essays, both of you, both of your schools had slight changes to your updates to your supplements this year. Um, could you tell us um, what is the process, just briefly, of kind of coming up with these supplemental questions and deciding if they'll change? Corinne, if we could start with you. Absolutely. Um, you got the right person here because I've been on the essay updating committee uh, for the last four or five years, I think. Um, it's one of my favorite committees to serve on, and it honestly gets a little bit heated at times. Um, we start talking about these updates, um, usually in May or June, we'll have some all staff retreats, talk about which essays worked and didn't work for the year, um, and kind of big ideas. Do we want to stay with two short supplements? Do we want it to be one long one? Do we really dislike how um, answers came into one of our really short answers and it wasn't what we were sort of getting at? So the big group will decide this is working, this isn't working, this is where we should make adjustment. Then there'll be like four to six of us that sign up for this subcommittee um, and we meet um, a few times over the next summer. And we sort of just sit there and workshop and we start with what are we trying to get out of the students um, and what question will elicit that. And we're not trying to trick anyone. So a lot of the conversation we have will be, all right, we have this general question that we're asking, is any of this language com too complex? Um, is any of this confusing? Do we need to sort of explain what we're trying to get at? Um, then once we come up with those essays, we send it back to the whole group um, and usually give like a two week deadline. And then usually the day before they'll come back and be like, 
we want this, this, and this changed. Um, it's a long process. And like I said, some years it's just like, okay, not much to change. This year really took a long time. Um, and it's fun. I feel like every year we get a little bit better and a little clearer and a little more interesting with what we're asking, but I don't think there will ever be a year where we change nothing because we're always trying to be the best at getting better. And what about at Touch JT? I'm, I'm happy to hear that we're, that we're not the only ones who spend a lot of time <laughs> thinking about these questions. They, they are intentional. And to Corinne's point, th these are a representative, they're representative of our institutions and what, like what we value. Um, that's what we want students to take away from them. We have conversations about whether we should ask any supplemental questions. Is, is, the, is, the, is the process of asking, does that introduce an unnecessary barrier uh, to students entering our, our selection process. Um, we've decided to ask questions because we feel like it communicates who we are and it gives students another opportunity to show more of themselves to us specifically. And so that's where we've landed and why we ask the questions that we ask. Um, we do take a close look at them every year. We try to get a sense of um, what was the general like thinking in this committee about the questions? Were we getting the types of answers we were looking for? Was there something we could do to strengthen the question to get those? Are different kinds of applicants connecting with different questions? Are engineers more likely to answer this question than that question? Do we, does that mean something to us? Um, so we try to figure out things like that. Um, we added a question last year, uh, where are you on your journey of engaging with or fighting for social justice? Um, and that question, we added that in June of 2020, um, specifically because Tufts has a very strong commitment to civic engagement, to social justice, and with everything that was going on in our country at that time, we wanted to give students an outlet. We wanted to give them a chance to just share with us where they're at as they think about that. Um, and so some students answered that and some answered some of the other questions. Um, so these are, these, are, these are living questions that, that can change from year to year. We keep the response volume short, which can be a challenge, um, but the idea is to make it um, accessible to students. And it's not, we don't think of them as essays. Um, an English teacher would be mad if, if they heard me say that 250 words is an essay. Um, it's really just a relatively short statement um, that, that gives us more context into a student. And that almost was, I feel like, per too perfectly timed because um, it's the perfect segue to my next question, which is actually um, how is call writing these kinds of responses or essays, whatever we want to call them, um, how is it different from the writing that students are doing for a typical school paper? Because this is often, in our experience, one of the hardest parts is getting students to, in a way, um, at least whether it's unlearn or at least break free of some of the more rigid or strict um, rubrics that they've been taught for school. And so um, if, um, if you could speak to that, just how it's different to give students a sense of, of maybe how to arrange their thinking when they start to approach these essays. Um, JT, if we could start with you. Sure. So I uh, I spent five years of my career as a director of college counseling at a at a small school working with students through the application process. And I remember I was so used to seeing the end product as an admissions reader and then seeing the development process for students. It, you're right. It is a it is a different way of thinking and it is new to students. Um, and they're not always comfortable with it. Um, I think of the the supplemental essays as. I mean, cre creativity is welcome. Um, uh, uh, th just saying what you need to say, don't worry about like the structure so much. Yes, it is an example of writing. Um, we are thinking about your writing, like how you demonstrate that to us, but it's also just a chance to communicate your ideas in a different way. Y you can use contractions, you can use uh, quotes, you can, you, can, you can have different length sentences, you can do all the things that you wanna do without feeling like you're, you're trying to impress a faculty. I think Corinne and I have both said, like we're not faculty members, we are not, we're not judging like these, these things that are, that are beyond our scope, we're human beings um, that are used to reading the language of 17 year olds. And so we encourage 
17 year olds to write that way. Um, and there, it's an application and there's some weight to the process that this is not a tweet. This is not your friend's social media account. It's not those things, um, but it is a moment to be a little bit more creative and free than you might be with an academic paper. Thank you. Um, and Corinne, if I could ask you, uh, just in the interest of time, I wanna make sure we get to some of these other questions that we have. Um, what are some common mistakes that you see students make in their approach to these essays? Perfect question, because I was going to say that JT captured everything and I was going to give a few tips. So I think I'll just give the We're tips. We're on a roll here. This yeah, isn't planned, people. This isn't planned. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing is, is getting stuck in kind of that five paragraph format, right? The intro, the conclusion, and three supporting points. That's really now what we're looking for. Um, and with that, one of the biggest mistakes that I see students make all the time is that they're not getting to the present quickly enough. Um, because they're trying to follow that high school format, because they're trying to do the intro and this whole thing, um, they might not get to the present until almost the last paragraph. And that's the opposite of what we wanna see. I tend to recommend that a student should get to the present, if not the future, no more than a quarter of a th or a third at most of the way through the essay. Um, they might want to start out by saying something like, when I was five, I got this Lego set, but then like leave five in the past. We're not admitting your five-year-old self or your eight-year-old self or your 12-year-old self or even your 14-year-old self. We're looking to admit your 17, 18-year-old self. Um, and so we want to see where you are now. And like I said before, I always like when kind of that essay finishes looking forward, at least the personal statement part. Um, and, and that could be more general, like looking forward in your life, not necessarily to Yale or to Tufts. Um, but we're really, that's almost always, it's not the worst mistake in the world. If we love a student, it's not going to keep them out of our campuses. But it is one where I often am reading an essay and I look halfway through and I'm like, that's where your paper or your essay should have started is halfway in and I want to see what happens next and I'm missing that. So I would sort of say that's the number one thing for me. God bless you for saying that. <laughs> Maybe you've been sitting in on my meetings, Karen, but I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I, people really get so bogged down in the lead in and the backstory, which I always acknowledge like is a big part of it, right? But like we've only got 650 words or less and we're most interested in where it, you landed, where'd you end up? Because that's who you guys are going to get in the fall. And so I think you're also right when you mentioned even the 14 year old self, let alone much younger, kids change so much, you know, a ninth grader compared to a 12th grader even, you know, you can really see the difference. And I think um, students think that having something with them their whole lives makes it gives it more validity or something maybe um but you know you guys are interested in who's coming to campus next year and so getting to that presence earlier on is like something that we work really really hard and constantly are kind of going back i think also when you're drafting because this is always a process right is you may need that first draft or second draft to be a lot of backstory right you got to get it out <laughs> and then He'll take the end, pull it up to the beginning, and then draft three starts, you know. Um, but thank you so much. That's super, super helpful advice. Um, also, in kind of similar is that the standing out is thrown out a lot, you know, with admissions. And students think they need this extended metaphor and they need this like snappy, like beginning or end and try with these sort of gimmicky kind of things because it's going to stand out as being unique. Can you tell us, each of you, what does, when, when we throw around this term that you need to stand out or you want to stand out, what does it look like or what does that kind of sound like or look like for you? Um, and Corinne, we can start with you. Yeah, I can get on my soapbox all day about this, um, but what I'll say is that a lot of times students, parents, families, counselors, wherever you are in this process, people will say, well, you have to be unique to get in. Um, and you gotta throw that out because we got 47,000 applications last year. 
I truly have not read an essay in probably the last three years where I said, wow, that's unique. And I've never read anything like that before. Um, and that's also a lot of pressure on a student to think of something unique about them. So if you take that away and take away that idea, it makes all of this a little bit more manageable. Um, the thing that stands out for me is a student's authentic voice and personality. Um, two things that I love, you don't have to do these things, but they always kind of catch my attention. If a student can make me laugh, um, because a lot of people think I need to cry for them to get in. And I, if I was crying all day long, I would have quit my job in about two weeks. That's awful. Sometimes stories are a little bit more emotional, but I cannot read 25 to 30 emotional stories in a day. So if I can laugh, that's awesome. If you're not funny, don't try to be funny. It won't be funny. Um, and then the other thing, almost to a JT said earlier, is when a student can teach me something. Um, and I don't mean in kind of like a mansplainy way where your whole topic then becomes about fishing or something like that. Um, but if a student is describing an interest and then I learn about the interest in the way that JT learned about video games, that's cool for me. That makes my job enjoyable. I obviously work in education. So that's something that stands out, but it doesn't have to be there at the same time. Yeah. And I think also standing out when you each talk about learning about something that's outside of your wheelhouse, that also means communicating very simply and directly. So like big words and getting really complicated, that actually loses you, right? If you actually know, we all know, right? We're talking about admissions. We can speak about this very clearly and simply. We're not overcomplicating it. If you're talking about something that you know, it actually should come out very simply, but the, the big words and the kind of sound, again, sounding smarter, anytime I feel like you have to make someone read again or, or kind of wonder, what is this about? We don't want to go quite there. Um, JT, what about for you for standing out? What does it look like or what does it mean on your end? Yeah, I, the, 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 uh, the students who dig deep, that is one of the phrases that, that I've used in various committees is, does a student dig deep? Does this essay dig deep? Do I, do I have a sense of who this student is at the end of this essay? I, I generally don't care about the topic. I, gen, like, I don't care about that so much as like, am I learning something about the student here? Those are the essays that, that stand out in a positive way. The, there, there are essays, unfortunately, that stand out because I view them as a missed opportunity. I get to the end of it and I'm like, oh my gosh, that was so polished. That was so overwritten. Um, I just don't know who this person is at the end of it um, because there might've been too many editors or too much thesaurus usage going on, things like that. So the ones that stand out are the ones that the, are, I hate the word authentic, um, but um, it's the essays that are the most authentic to the student that is writing them. And, you, and, 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 and every student is unique. A current point is a good one that we read the same topics and same ideas frequently. And every student is unique. And so we just want them to use that voice knowing that there's someone on the other side who wants to fall in love with them, help us fall in love with them. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking out for them in the process. I think maybe replacing unique with like thinking about connecting, which is by the mm -hmm. way, I shared human experiences, not ones that you know, are unique and never heard of or so out there that, you know, again, it, it's going to be, you know, so surprising or, or whatnot. Um, we have to wrap up. So I have a couple more questions. Um, one, so both of your schools ask questions that I think are the hardest to respond to, which are the ones that are between 100 and 150 words or 125 um, for Yale, but no, no, who's counting? Um, but anyway, between 100 and 150 to me is brutal. Um, and I think for students is so hard. Um, can you, I assume that this very short length is intentional on your part, um, as is everything on the side of the supplement, but can you share a little bit um, sort of what your hope is or maybe why so short or kind of how that might be different from the slightly longer 250-ish word ones and JT, if we could start with you. Yeah, I was going to say during the conversation earlier about like that first part of the essay where students wait too long to get to where they want to go, the, the term that I was taught is throat clearing. Typically, when you write an essay, your first paragraph is throat clearing. So write it and then delete it and start with what would have been your second paragraph. That's 
That's part of why our Y Tufts is 100 to 150 words. We don't want throat clearing. And we, if it was a longer essay, it would be weightier, it would be heavier, students would overthink it more, we think. Um, so the idea is like, get to the point. Like you've done your research, you've chosen us as one of the schools you're applying to, why? Uh, what is it about us? And do that in a, in a pithy, short, meaningful to you way. Um, and and uh, that's what we're looking for. And what about at Yale, Corinne? I think that that idea of throat clearing, I've never heard it before, but I think that that's really helpful. Um, I really think that we're also looking to see if the student can answer the question, um, because a lot of times in the bigger essays, um, they might not be answering the question, but because it's 650 words, let's say we can be like, all right, well, something here kind of answered it. Whereas these are so targeted, we're like, can you take an assignment, take an directive, answer it in a short, pithy, non-throat clearing way, uh, get to the point with a little bit of creativity maybe, or at least your personality and your voice coming through. Um, so a lot of it truly is, I think for both of us, answer the prompt um, and don't overthink the prompt for yourself. Yeah, the answering the prompt, I always say it's a basic thing, but so often, I don't know if it's students seeing similar questions, you know, and kind of almost like forgetting that they're actually, they might be sort of parallel, um, or one might be pointing you in a very particular direction, let's say towards academics, but another one might be open ended. And, you know, always look, I think it was, um, I think it was JT who was saying earlier that, you know, there are clues in the questions, um, you know, that that look at the language, you know, look and see. And, and but it's so important to actually read the question and see are there different parts? Are there, you know, what what are you trying to get at? Um, but yeah, those those short, short ones, I think, are the are the hardest um, to write. But um, but yeah, thank you. And now to, to wrap up, one thing that I always like to do is I always like to ask um, the, our guests to respond to questions on their supplements uh, to hear a little bit from them. So I'm going to start with JT. Um, you guys have a 200 to 250 word question and you actually give students an option. There are a few different ones. I'm going to ask you one about community. You've talked a lot about that tonight. Um, the question from Tufts is, um, how have the environments or experiences of your upbringing, your family, home, neighborhood, or community shaped the person you are today? So if you were going to kind of give us a sense of how you might answer that question, um, we would love to hear it. Yeah. So we, we asked this question because students are the result of their lived experiences, and we want to give students a way to express that to us. Um, uh, for me, if I were writing this question now, um, I would, I would talk about growing up as a low income kid, uh, whose parents did not graduate from college. I, I got a Pell Grant when I went to college, um, and I went to a high school where the majority of my classmates did not go to four-year colleges. I worked a, 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 a nearly full-time job throughout junior and senior year of high school, um, and uh, then landed in a, in a, in a, in a school that um, took very good care of me and had very generous financial aid policies. And so I, I think a lot about the transformative power of education. I think a lot about where I came from, where education and generous financial aid policies got me. Um, so I would talk about sort of like I, I approach the work of admissions now um, because of where I came from. And there's a there's a human piece of this. There's an understanding about marginalized identities and lack of access to education um, that I that I feel. Um, so I would talk about how my environment in that space translates into how I view the space that I currently operate in. I, as a 17 year old, I wouldn't say that quite as articulately, I'm sure, um, but that would be the sentiment I, I would be, seek to express. <laughs> well, we, to be fair, we have asked you to answer it for yourself today. Um, you know, if I was sharing my, my essay from when I was 17, it would look different from one that I would be writing today. So that is a, that is a good reminder. Um, thank you, thank you for that. Um, and then for Yale, I love to focus on what I call the, and you guys call the quick takes. I love those um, when there's like these short kind of quick answers that students can give. Um, Yale gives uh, 300 characters, I believe, uh, or no, uh, 200 characters, 35, about 35 words. And so I'm going to do like a quick fire round with you, Corinne, if you don't mind. Um, 
So you're going to get my honest answers as long as you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, that's, that's the name of the game, right? That's oh. what we're trying to encourage students to do is just have fun with it. I often find that when I'm reading these um, shorter essays and supplements in general, that I learn more about students in these like shorter, faster things than in the longer ones. So I always say, have fun with it. Um, so to start, what inspires you? Sure, this is gonna maybe be a hot take, but I'm going with Lil Nas X's new album because it shows you don't have to fit the mold to succeed. And also that's what I want is an incredible video. So. How cool is he, by the way? He, I, yeah, yep. I love that. Um, Yale students embrace the concept. This is a new question this year. Um, Yale students embrace the concept of and rather than or pursuing arts and sciences, tradition and innovation, defined goals and surprising detours. What is an example of an and that you embrace? Yeah, so this one was partly my brainchild for this year. And I love this essay topic and prompt. I'm going with, I'm a great mix of routine and impulsivity. Um, I'll be the person that stays in and watches documentaries, but then decides to book a trip leaving the next day. Yeah. And Yale's residential colleges regularly host conversations with guests representing a wide range of experiences and accomplishments. What person, past or present, would you invite to speak and what would you ask them to discuss? This I think is the hardest one, honestly. Um, and I just chose Oprah off the top of my head. Um, and I would ask her, did you know that you were breaking ground as it happened or not until later? Um, but I could and, have gone in a million directions, so. And then finally, um, you're teaching a Yale course. What is it called? I'm picking the favorite answer to this that I ever read, not my own answer. It was treason and tease, T-E-A-S, um, which discussed government overthrows while sipping tea from the region. I thought that was so funny and cool. <laughs> a, a, and a memorable answer, a true um, example of creativity, right? And having fun with it. Yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you so, so much to both of you. This was not only fun, but it was super informative. And um, we really, really, really appreciate your honesty because there's so much misinformation and a lot of confusion about this process and it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and so you so uh, willingly and openly sharing your knowledge makes everything easier for the students, for the counselors out there and we're so appreciative. So thank you for taking time during this insanely busy time of year. Um, and we wish you good luck as you um, go out of, I guess, virtual or in-person, depending travel season and into reading season. And we'll see you on the other side. And thank you, Barry, for being a wonderful host. And thank you all for joining us. Thank Agreed. Thank you so much. Thanks, JT. Thanks, Corinne. Have a good Bye. night, everybody.